Thank you for joining us for the DFM pageant. Um, we're going to kick off straight away. We've got six fantastic DFMs. We're going to talk about what they do and, and how they build their future forward-looking portfolios. Um, they've got three, four minutes to talk about things, and then they've got a chance to take some quick-fire questions from the audience. Um, just raise your hand and fire away uh, once they've finished, OK? So the idea is to keep this at a fast pace. And please, the, the more questions and the better the questions, the more fun we'll have and hopefully help digest some of that food from downstairs. So we're going to kick off with, um, with Patrick from Canaccord. So Patrick, your th four minutes starts now. Thank you. This is like the wor world's worst ever Britain's Got Talent panel, I guess. Um, but no, no, just to be very, very quick about what we do and how we do it, we've got about a five-year track record this week um, at, in investing in thematic ESG strategies. Um, what that means really is that we try in, and invest in environmental and social innovation. That can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people, but I think when you start looking at our performance track record and how we have generated that, you can really just think about it in terms of two main ideas. The first being climate transition, the second being economic growth that works for more people. Um, that first group of ideas in terms of the environment, there'll be stuff that you'll have seen before and understand in terms of clean energy, um, clean water, electric vehicles. Um, that second group of companies that are helping people, um, smaller group, you can't really find a social um, issue that there's a consensus globally on how to solve it, but you'll see ideas in terms of education, innovative, disruptive, healthcare, um, and even kind of more esoteric ideas like cybersecurity and robotics. Um, I think what differentiates what we do really is that we genuinely are thematic. Um, the portfolios don't look like anything else out there. Um, and um, hopefully they're more engaging and interesting for people to be invested in. Um, I think I've spoken for about three minutes. No, you've got one out, one minute, 45 seconds yet to go, Patrick. Do I? Feel free to continue. Wow. I will take questions. Yeah, great. So, so yeah, ultimately, two big macro trends are going to drive markets over the next five to ten years. They're going to be climate transition, and it's going to be more inclusive growth. You're seeing that happen globally. You're seeing it happen everywhere. You're seeing it happen in terms of political, economic, and environmental incentives all aligning at the same time. Um, it's going to be very, very difficult to capture those trends if you're not in a dedicated portfolio. Um, it's very hard to do as a small part of the pie, um, and, and, and that's kind of what these strategies are there to do. Um, but, but yeah, delighted to take any questions thereafter. You're very welcome to have a look at our performance track record um, and have a look at the kind of awards that we've won. Um, I didn't want to boast. Thanks. Okay, no problem. Anybody got any quick questions for Patrick? <clears throat> I have one, quick one. What's, which portfolio are you most excited about of the portfolios you have at the moment? So there are five risk-rated portfolios. I think in terms of what we're the most excited about right now, it would be... Sure. So, I could hear him from here, so I was... <laughs> yeah, look... We're really excited about the stuff that's been beaten up the most by the markets because it looks a bit like a technology stock. So that's what's exciting us at the moment. If you're looking at robotics and collaborative robotics and the use cases for all of those, um, ultimately everyone hates it because it's not an oil company and it doesn't seem to work very well against inflation. So yeah, that's what's, get, that's what's getting us excited day in, day out. Yeah. Okay. Any questions from anybody else? How big a risk is the rise of right-wing authoritarianism to some of these trends that you're talking about? I think, in a way, it's a tailwind, actually, because I think what all of this stuff is doing is, can we pay people more money, and can we do something about global and uh, national inequality? Ultimately, that's that second trend, not climate transition, the making economic growth work for more people. Actually, I think you're starting to see that with stuff like um, paying people's energy bills. 
this is a tailwind for this form of investing. People just don't know it yet. Great, great question, by the way. Excellent, thank you. Okay, let's move on. It's like a baton change, isn't it? it? Is. Relay. The relay. John, uh, we've got John from Castlefields. John, fire away. Thank you, Charest. Thank you, Patrick, as well. Uh, is the audio okay at the back? Thank you. Thumbs up. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is John Alexander. I'm head of client engagement at Castlefield. Uh, we're delighted to be here today because of some great names above us, um, and we're probably the least well known of any of them. So, with your permission, I'd like to maybe just tell you a story about who we are, where we've come from, and what we do. Um, by way of background, Castlefield is a sustainable investment management business based in Manchester. We were established in 2002 and our seed clients were all charities and we still look after a lot of charity clients today. Um, as you'd expect over the last 20 years, um, our client base has expanded so we now look after private individuals, thoughtful people who want to do good with their money and more recently the advisor and wealth manager space as well. Uh, it was from our experience of working with charities that our specialism in ethical and sustainable investing was born. And a couple of years ago, we decided to trademark the name The Thoughtful Investor uh, to set ourselves apart from the marketplace. So what does The Thoughtful Investor mean? And why do we feel that should be important to you and maybe to your clients? Well, over recent years, we feel that the profession has adopted a whole alphabet soup of acronyms and abbreviations and buzzwords. Uh, the ESG phrase is now everywhere. Greenwashing is commonplace in many sectors and industries, including our own. And whilst this increased interest in thoughtful investing, as we call it, is good and exciting, I think it can lead to confusion for clients and it can lead to confusion for advisors. Do you really know what you're investing in or recommending? Well, the thoughtful investor means that not only do we take our uh, technical, sustainable investing responsibilities seriously, but we also structure our business in such a way that we aim to create the very best environment for good clients' outcomes. We hold ourselves out to the highest standards and welcome the most rigorous challenge. When we're constructing portfolios, we challenge our investee companies or other fund managers that we're investing with on all possible environmental, social and governance issues. And we feel we can only leg legitimately do that on the basis that we take such matters into consideration in our own business practices. Apologies. Um, we're an employee-owned business uh, with staff of 65 co-owners and each member of staff owns a part of the business. Our only external shareholder is a grant-making charitable foundation. We invest for the long term, typically with low turnover portfolios. We don't operate any performance-related bonus arrangements across the business, not for portfolio managers or regrettably for sales and marketing staff. And all our co-owners are aligned to provide the best client outcomes over the long term. We genuinely offer values-based investing from the perspective of being a values-based investment organization ourselves. So how do we look at building forward-looking portfolios? Well, I think it's safe to say that ethical investing has changed a lot over the last 20 years since Castlefield was established. It started out very much along the lines of exclusion and people deciding for good reason what they didn't want to invest in. But this has evolved over recent years to seek out positive reasons to invest in companies and sectors and themes, and to see what impact our investments can make for the greater good. So within our proprietary investment framework, which we call BEST, we set out clearly what we don't invest in, and we also set out the 10 positive themes that we do want to invest in. Themes such as health and well-being, cyber and digital security, and environmental management. In a practical sense, we launched our model portfolio service in 2012, and so our nine models now have a 10-year track record which demonstrates that we've achieved good, sustainable, long-term returns through a variety of market conditions. And whilst doing this, we've achieved high ESG scores from external parties to demonstrate that our process works. To mark our 10-year performance track record, we also reduced our annual management charge to 10 basis points. Who said we can't do marketing? Um, in summary, we feel that the values we demonstrate as a business are our key differentiators. Employee share ownership, long-term sustainable growth, respect and responsibility, independence and innovation are our values, and our purpose is quite simply to gather assets to do good. Thank you for your interest. Happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Any questions? Uh, any shout-outs for Manchester? 
Just one question for me. What, what things have you got in the pipeline? Have you got anything uh, in terms of new developments coming along? No, I think, um, I think what we're really excited about is we've, we've done this for a long time. Um, and, you know, we've got a lot of satisfied clients who refer and recommend clients to us. I think the exciting challenge for ourselves is we've only just dipped a toe into the external distribution of our products and services to the advisor market. So the fact that we've got existing multi-asset funds, model portfolios, and single strategy funds for those that want to build their own portfolios, um, we're just really excited about striking relationships, getting support, explaining to people what we do. Good stuff. Thank Thanks. You Thanks, Jeresh. Please pass on the mic. Mm, OK, our next presenter, we've got Peter from King & Shackson. Peter, your four minutes starts now. Thanks, Suresh. Thanks, John. Uh, yeah, good to see everybody. Um, good afternoon. Um, yeah, just feels like a speed dating thing, this. It's a bit strange. But uh, no, King & Shackson, um, we're celebrating uh, our 20th anniversary this year um, in terms of managing ESG impact uh, mandates for clients. So that's great. So we've got a long heritage in this space, uh, a lot of experience. Not everybody knows about it. It's not necessarily a high street name um, out there, but uh, we're getting more and more um, interest, obviously. But, uh, so we're celebrating that. We also won the um, Best um, Ethical Discretionary Fund Manager Award at Moneyfax recently. Just a bit of a plug there. That's for the third consecutive year as well. So it's always nice to be recognized uh, in that way as well. So something to be proud of. I mean, this, I mean, as King of Shackson, we all invest in the business in, in this way. Um, it's in the DNA of the business. So that's uh, something to, to mention as well. Um, so we manage uh, distinct ESG impact uh, portfolios uh, for intermediaries only. We don't offer you know, portfolios directly or anything else. I know there's been concerns around that area. So we only offer that through intermediaries. They are quite distinct. I mean, there's, there's, there's 11 model portfolios through all the, all the platforms that you know about. Um, seven of them are funds only, and four of them are direct equity, equity, which we can touch on. But I think the important piece here is about, we've talked so much about greenwash and classifications and branding and, and transparency and all these sorts of things. I mean, that's something that's extremely important to us. The screening practices that we operate is rigorous, and it cuts across what's called a, the spectrum of capital. You could do a 45-minute presentation on spectrum of capital alone, um, talking about responsible, sustainable, and impact labels and labeling has again, has again been discussed. So the you know the, the, the funds and there's a lot of fund managers here, and we we hold a lot of the funds uh, in terms of the fund managers that are here today. Uh, we we do endorse them. But, uh, you know, you, you, we, we do like to have holdings that cut across that whole spectrum, so diversified across responsibility, sustainability, and impact. I think that's important to diversify across that piece, but it's important that you understand what that means as well. And the spectrum of capital is a very good graphic to explain it and actually also put a photographic image of that in front of a client. Um, but ESG, on the ESG side, we, you know, we see that as, as, as risk off, really. You know, it's probably going to be an accounting standard in the future. You know, it's data, it's quant data. That's all. Um, and the proprietary tools that provide the quant data, um, and so unfortunately, it's different as well. But it's great. I mean, it's, it's good quality. It's improving. It's a good starting point for us. And we get 80-page reports on one company, on ESG, for example. But, you know, it doesn't mean once you have a piece of ESG data, that they have any negative or positive screen attached to that business, okay? Um, so you've got to go a lot further in terms of the qualitative piece, and we do a lot of that qualitative work to ensure that actually the underlying holdings meet client expectations, your you know, client expectations. Um, otherwise, you know, what's the point? So, we pride ourselves in sort of that, that rigorous screening ongoing and you know, um, rigorous screening approach that we have to the, to the models that we, that we operate. Uh, we, just, we also, you know, just to mention, we also have a full you know, gold standard bespoke um, discretionary service as well, as well, where clients do need to actually tell, tell you exactly what they don't want to invest in, uh, but also what they do want to invest in and then we'll you know, produce a, a, a 
a bespoke detailed proposal based on that questionnaire. So that's kind of us in a, in a, in a nutshell. Um, probably almost time up. Yeah, so thank you for listening and uh, happy to take any, any questions from Suresh or... Anybody got a question? Come on, guys. Are you still eating? You're still digesting, aren't you? Digesting that, that content. I, I do have a question. What a surprise. Um, tell me more about that. You mentioned the equity portfolios. I'm kind of used to DFMs having fund portfolios. Tell me about, a little bit more about the equity portfolios, how they're constructed. Yeah, uh, yeah we have. Um, yeah, they are quite different. It comes from advisor demand, actually. Uh, we, we, we hold those the constituent parts is circa 50% listed equities and 50% uh, collectives. So you really go up into the space of sustainability and impact there and kind of hone in into certain areas. You know, areas we like such as real estate investment trusts. You know, we've never got caught with the property debacles and that's possibly going to happen again with normal standard commercial retail property. We only hold affordable housing, social housing, homelessness, uh, medical property, that sort of thing, in real estate investment trusts. So those sorts of areas are, are included in there, along with the infrastructure um, arena, which was global, UK, Asia, you know, and the yield codes and infrastructure. So, yeah, so you could do get, you know, a high degree of impact exposure in the direct equity portfolios. Um, so uh, they're quite different, but they're wrapped in a model and available through your retail platforms. Okay. That's really interesting. Thank you very much for that. Okay. Let's pass on to Thank Ollie. You. Okay, we've got Ollie here uh, from Portfolio Metrics. Ollie, it's over to you. Thanks, Suresh. Um, hi, everyone. Um, my name's Oliver Jones, Investment Analyst at Portfolio Metrics, and I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking to you about our sustainable world portfolios. Um, in terms of track record, you know, we aren't new to ESG investing. Um, we launched Sustainable World in January 2017 following on from the success of our core portfolios that we launched in January 2013. Um, in the near six years, we've been investing in ESG. You know, we've seen the landscape evolve rapidly, and there's now a whole suite of available products to meet you know, various client needs. Um, the investment philosophy of Sustainable World is a dark green one that's focused on positive change. Um, we think that's important because um, we think, sorry, we think that's important because What's really important to us is what the portfolios are investing in, not what the portfolios aren't investing in to drive that positive change. To achieve this, our portfolios mainly use Article 9 funds that are focused on positive screening. Um, this involves selecting companies whose products and services are positively contributing to a number of different sustainable themes. Um, themes such as you know, clean energy, um, health and well-being, or even water management. Um, Sorry, um, engagement is also you know, a really important part of our process. Um, we're fully aware that no company is perfect when it comes to sustainability. Um, and also, our experience in this space has shown that actually often the largest positive impact um, is generated as a result of those engagements and companies transitioning away from those you know, harmful business practices towards more sustainable products and services. Um, in terms of implementation, we have a definite preference for active funds over passive ESG alternatives. The reason that we have this preference um, is because you know, we really believe that to truly understand what a company's product and service and how it impacts society and the environment, that's really an active management process. You really need to get in there and understand how those companies' operations are impacting, and it's not something you can just rely on you know, public disclosures for. Um, the result of our sustainable process is a, you know, a diverse and differentiated portfolio of companies that are positively contributing to a wide variety um, of sustainable investment themes. What makes our portfolios truly unique is the ability to customize the portfolios to meet individual client needs. Um, firstly, instead of offering you know, five model portfolios from various points along the risk curve, Clients in Sustainable World get their own unique portfolio that's tailored exactly to their risk level. Um, secondly, as well, while we do really believe that sustainable, dark green sustainable investing even, is an active process, we also don't believe that cost should be um, a barrier to clients investing in a more green portfolio. 
So what we also offer is a passively tilted version of Sustainable World, whereby we bring in passive ESG funds to varying degrees to allow us just to bring down that portfolio cost to perhaps help clients move into a more green portfolio. Um, finally, the team responsible for Sustainable World at Portfolio Metrics is the same 12 people that are responsible for all our portfolios. Um, the team is very diverse. We're based across the globe here in the UK, in South Africa, and in the United States. Um, 10 of the team have passed all three levels of the CFA exams, and five of us have also passed the CFA's ESG and investing certificate. Um, on top of for UK portfolios, we also manage a range of ESG and sustainable portfolios for Irish clients. And at the end of last year, we launched a Sustainable World Global Equity Fund of Funds for South African-based investors, um, which is the first and only of its kind available to clients. So finally, thanks everyone for taking time out of their lunch to listen to me. Um, I look forward to some questions. Excellent. Thank you, Ollie. Any questions for Ollie? Anybody? Yep. Oh. Did you hear that? Yeah, just about how yeah. we find firms in the UK for our portfolios. Right. Um, so the way we build portfolios um, is it starts from the asset allocation, top down, and once that's set, that's actually the same across all our portfolios, whether you're in a core portfolio or an income or a sustainable portfolio. Um, we then outsource the management of those asset classes to third-party funds. So we use Royal London, for example, and Lion Trust, who are both here today. Um, so we're then talking to the managers you know, about what's available. And actually, from our interactions with our UK managers, is once you sort of get out of that FTSE 100 space within the UK, there's actually a real array of really interesting companies that are really actually having a positive impact um, you know, across, the, yeah, across the piece. Yeah. No, thank you. Yeah, thanks for that, Ollie. Thanks. No Over to Kate. So Kate from Rathbones Green Bank. Over to you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so I'm Kate Elliott. I'm Head of Ethical, Sustainable and Impact Research at Rathbone Green Bank Investments. Uh, we are the specialist ESI investment team within Rathbone's group. Uh, we specialize in discretionary wealth management for private clients, charities and trusts, uh, extensive experience working with uh, IFAs and, and a range of intermediaries. And really, our aim in this space is to make sustainable investing simple for you and your clients. Uh, we heard from Julia this morning, there's a complete alphabet soup of, of different terms and abbreviations that get thrown around. And it, it can sometimes feel like, like you need a, a degree or a PhD even to, to understand and navigate this space. So what we try and do is basically do all the hard work for you. We have an in-house team of, of ESI researchers. So I, sorry, throw another acronym into the, the mix there, but the Ethical, Sustainable and Impact uh, researchers. So we are solely looking at the sustainability performance of organizations. Um, so that's myself and my, my team of researchers. Uh, we look across a set of eight sustainable development themes that sit at the core of our investment process. They cover environmental issues like energy and climate, social issues like inclusive economies. Within Green Bank, we have a set of minimum standards. Um, so any company or organization that is kind of under consideration for, for inclusion on our buy list has to meet um, these minimum standards, which are framed around avoiding organizations that are causing harm in the world. Not necessarily finding those that are 100% squeaky clean, but where there are issues with some of those organizations, we know complex uh, businesses, issues can arise uh, across their operations. It's about understanding how well they are aware of those risks and how well they are mitigating them. Beyond that, that baseline that um, kind of applies across every portfolio we manage, we also enable our clients to tailor those portfolios to meet their individual values. Again, I think sometimes we forget when we talk about ESG or sustainability, really what motivates people to invest in this way is an alignment with their own beliefs, with their own values, with what's really fundamentally important to them. And that is not the same from one client to the next. 
So what we don't require is, is for you to put your clients into a one-size-fits-all one solution. We can tailor it to meet their financial objectives. We can tailor it to meet their sustainability objectives, whether that be particular areas they want to avoid or particular areas of interest for them. And because we've got 20 years of experience in this space, because we have the in-house uh, research and expertise there, we really do fundamentally understand each of the companies that we're investing in. And that enables us to have that accountability, to build that trust with you and your clients, but also to have that quite granular level of tailoring within portfolios. And I think that kind of longevity, the integrity, and really the trust element of it is, is critical here. Because again, we see one of our differentiators as being that cultural alignment of being people who, when an individual walks into a room with us, they will feel like these are people who get us. These are people who understand why I'm interested in sustainability and who I trust to implement that and look after my money. The other thing that I really just wanted to briefly mention before I, I wrap up and, and Ceres kind of gets the, the klaxon out, hopefully not, yeah. um, hopefully. was just around our, our active engagement strategy. So again, this is about thinking. We heard about impact of portfolios and impact of, of the investments that we make. But the other really important dimension to, to the impact of investments is around what we can do on behalf of your clients to push for positive change in the world through the way in which we manage uh, their money. And that's something that we do through a very detailed, um, quite long-term dialogue with, with organizations to either address particular issues of concern or push for positive change across a range of issues which I won't go into on threats of Claxon. <laughs> Thank you for that, Kate. Any questions for Kate? Just a question about the disclosure and clarity of this goes across the whole piece of NPS. How is that handled compared to, say, a collective vehicle? What are the challenges and what are the opportunities to differentiate? Well, I think with, with individual tailored portfolios, one of the benefits is that full transparency. We, we provide a range of reporting to clients. It, it's very much understanding the level of, of information that they want. So we can provide breakdowns by uh, sustainable development themes. So they can really understand everything that is in their portfolio, why it's held, what's the, the primary positive reason there. But we can also do narrative reporting. So we produce one pages on, on each of the companies that might be held within portfolios. We do an annual ethical news review. So again, it's a reminder of, of what they hold and why. And all of that is about, we, we don't want to be seen to be hiding something. We want it to be very transparent, very clear to them what they hold and why. And also for them to feel that we are approachable and, and we can be asked kind of, oh, I've, I've read this thing in your report. Can you tell me a little bit more about that issue? Or I've seen this thing in the news. How is that impacting either from a financial perspective or a, a sustainability perspective holdings within their portfolio? But we think that's absolutely critical, that transparency. We heard it um, from the FCA this morning. Thanks for that great question. Thanks, Kate. Our last but by no means least presenter, Stuart from RSMR. Stuart, take it away. Thank you, Suresh. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Stuart Smith. I am head of MPS and also part of the investment fund research team at RSMR. Um, my MPS team and I run four responsible MPS portfolios which have a track record dating back to 2016 for the earliest portfolios. But I think the, the main positive I'd like to, to bring out for those portfolios is that we draw upon the investment fund research that we do at RSMR uh, and the wider 12-person uh, team that we have to do that. Um, that team has over uh, 200 years investment experience collectively, uh, and we've been doing this since 2012, so it's not a new thing to us. Um, we, we've been researching responsible funds for that length of time. And, and we've used that experience really to, to pull together um, those four portfolios which are risk profiled to Dynamic Planner uh, and available for analysis through a number of other third party tools and available through uh, multi-platform. I th I'd like to frame so what we mean by responsible um, within our philosophy actually on, on ESG and relating back to what was spoken about earlier today 
our philosophy, and it's stated in our methodology document uh, within our fund research on ESG, is it our belief is it will be a standard, uh, ESG analysis will be standard across all investment funds at some point. Uh, we know there are a number of um, funds that run in that transition, to use that word, um, and a number of funds have a long way to go. But we believe for responsible, it needs to be a lot more than ESG. So in terms of our categorization of the funds that we use, we have four categories. And the first one is sustainability, which you've heard a, a lot about today. And that's really uh, funds and for managers and groups that are uh, positively supporting uh, change, uh, whether it be environmental, social, and governance, uh, a number of other factors. Uh, the second one is, is ethical, so the traditional ethical funds that are still out there, so using predominantly negative screening processes, but some uh, have incorporated uh, positive screening as well. Uh, the third one is impact investing, which we've heard about today, and we know that there is not many impact funds currently out there. There is uh, a number that have been launched more recently, but for us, impact is for a fund manager and a fund to be able to demonstrate that they can measure the impact that they are trying to produce in the management of their fund. So at the moment, we only rate a very small number of impact funds. Uh, and the fourth category is thematic. Um, again, which you've, uh, a phrase which you've heard a number of times today. So we would include um, funds such as environmental, e ecological, uh, clean energy, um, and we use a number of those funds again in the context of our, our portfolios. We, I say we have a track record back to 2016. We've run them in a discretionary environment since 2018 when, when the firm got discretionary permissions. Um, so the, the literature and performance is all available uh, for, for you all to look at. Um, I think in terms of uh, reporting, which, which the gentleman mentioned here, um, I think it's a thing that we're, we're working quite closely on. Um, because we invest in funds, it's a bit more difficult than if we were investing in sort of direct equities and direct bonds, because uh, we know that funds obviously themselves are actively managed and the composition of those funds change, changes over time. And they, they have their own reporting. And I think what I would say is we are very keen to support the fund managers and funds that have been doing this for a long time. So as some of my co uh, colleagues up here have said, um, a number of the funds and fund managers presenting today we've used and rated for, for a long time. So the likes of Royal London, Eden Tree, you know, well-known names in this, in this industry who've done, who've done this for, for 10 plus years. And we're very happy to uh, support those uh, particular firms. But we're always looking at, at new companies um, <coughs> transitioning into to this environment. Uh, and we're very conscious that a number of funds and fund management groups are, you know, a greenwashing has been mentioned and the, the move into the sustainable environment and we're very conscious of looking at those funds very c closely to see exactly what they are doing under the bonnet. So. Oh, I was close. I've been so Just desperate to use this. Any questions for, for Stuart? Just in that back corner. Could you... Go on, George. Yeah, go on at the marathon. Oh, can I squeeze through there? Um, given the number of categories that you invest from that you've just spoken about, how would you um, sum up your portfolios, your model portfolios, in terms of this is suitable for a client who? I think the idea behind our portfolios is not to be client specific. We're trying not to be all things to all people. Um, we we invest in a range of those fund categories that I mentioned, uh, and the idea is really for us to be, rather than providing something that's bespoke to an individual client, which we, we wouldn't be able to do in the MPS environment and the funds that we invest in, um, it's trying to provide a, a generic um, responsible solution for, for a number of the clients that are interested, maybe as a, a first introduction to that type of investing. And what would say in terms of the composition of the portfolios as a whole, we've, we've gradually moved towards introducing more sustainable, more thematic, more impact type funds into the portfolios and transitioning away from ethical, which I think is where the industry has naturally gone anyway. And that's certainly what we've found, in t both in terms of the new fund research we've been carrying on over the last probably four to five years, and then that's transitioned itself across into how we're managing the portfolios. Okay. 
Thank you so much for that question. Um, I think it was, I, I, one thing I've learned from today is that you guys as advisors have choice. I, I heard lots of different things, mass customization, engagement, thematics. Um, and, and I'd just like to say thank you for the panel for, for, for presenting and sharing their stories with everyone. If you'd like to join me in a round of applause.